I was doing a fine art degree in photography. I had a number of friends who were studying Australian history, natural history, ecological science, so would often go out to various sites and see stuff with them, but in my course I studied Australian art history. I was presented all these romantic images by Frederick McCubbin, who are romantic images of the early settlers, explorers, and that did not relate to my understanding of Australian history with the displacement of Aboriginal people. It also did not relate to my experience where all my grandparents migrated here in the 50s. So as my third year art project, I decided to walk up the Yarra River for seven days. Um, that seemed a logical conclusion at the time. <laughs> and uh, document my experience over those seven days, setting myself up instead of in the middle of the bush as a male bearded explorer, as a <laughs> female in the city, um, although eventually out in the bush, um, exploring. Uh, so I did that, but the first place I got dropped off was Westgate Park, so I took a taxi there the first bit, um, and it was early in the morning. It was this abandoned site. At the time, you could actually get further along, closer to the river mouth than you can now. And the photocopied pages of the Melways map that I had also had these proposed riverside park that would have gone all the way down to the river mouth, which of course didn't happen, but I was hopeful. And it was this, in the middle of all this industry, it was this vast area that was just empty to me <laughs> at the time um, and just forgotten. It certainly had been forgotten. Uh, so after that walk, I was very inspired to do something to help the river. I, I, joined a couple of friends groups like Friends of Herring Island and uh, Friends of Galatea Point and helped out with them but I kept going back to those images that I'd taken from my first spot at Westgate Park and kept going back to the river mouth. I knew it had incredible uh, cultural significance for both the Aboriginal people and for the, the colonists and also was aware of this map which I found very intriguing that the river had been moved. Um, so I decided I had the energy and I recruited some slightly reluctant friends and started the friends group. So that was the discovery is this empty space. Mm. Yeah. So it was empty and uh, did you have some notion at that time about biodiversity and what the potential was? I didn't, I wouldn't have framed it in terms of biodiversity. In fact, I probably didn't notice the biodiversity that was there in the long grass um, <laughs> uh, and Dry that the grass. blackberries <laughs> were actually providing some habitat. Um, all I saw was that there was a few remnant or re self-recruited salt marsh vegetation, uh, there were some remnant grasses and I wanted to put it back, uh, which was considering all the hills that are fake and and stuff was a bit naive, but it was a starting point. <laughs> For those of you who don't know much about the history of the park um, since it was established and a gift to the people of Victoria, um, it was uh, the, the original plan was a very grand one. We had a railway, full-scale railway line going through the park. It was it was to be set up as a major tourist attraction. There were tourist centres. There were all, all kinds of amazing things, which explains, you know, it's a bit of a puzzle when you don't know this, but explains some of the unusual forms, you know, ramping up and for the, there was a bridge across the dam and all sorts of things. Um, but what actually happened was that uh, there wasn't the money to do it and that um, it was notionally planted with indigenous species. Most of them came from WA, as far as, as, far as we can figure out. They became weedy and woody and it was, um, it was largely seen as a very degraded, um, not very interesting park. So um, that was up until the point when, when Naomi turned up on her river walk.
as I've said, you've pretty much um, masterminded what's in the park, and it is 10 distinct plant communities uh, and around 300 plant species. Um, tell us why you thought it was important to set out the landscape in that way. Yeah, well, as Naomi said, when she arrived, the park was uh, had been put in, had been built 15 years before, and since then it had uh, just went backwards. Uh, it was built and then pretty well neglected, apart from cutting the lawns and that sort of thing. So it was in a, a sorry state, and um, Naomi had the had the, the guts, I'd say, to start up a friends group um, way back then, and I come along uh, two years later. To work out what we were going to plant, it just sort of happened. Um, it, we didn't sit down there and then and, and um, you know, say this is going to be this. It sort of happened by uh, uh, organically, I suppose you could say. So it was mainly uh, Naomi and myself that uh, decided what we want. A lot of it um, had to do with what we particularly liked to grow or <laughs> we'd like to see to grow. Because the park is totally altered uh, from what you see there, I mean, if we, were, if we were going to recreate what was there, we'd have to take all that stuff away. All the hills in, um, in Westgate Park are, are, were created. It used to be dead flat, the floodplain of the Yarra. So obviously, uh, if we were going to recreate that, we'd have to take it all away again, which, which wasn't going to happen. So um, as for the appropriate uh, habitats, uh, uh, the nearest um, example would be up around the, the Royal Botanic Gardens in the city with the hills and the billabongs and uh, beside the river and that. So, so we, we sort of planted what, uh, what would have been there had the, uh, had the landscape, landscape been like that. So, um, and we did want to make it as, uh, uh, as much variety as possible. It, it's, not a, it's not a recreation of uh, existing bushland. We had more or less a, an open, open slather uh, as to what we planted. And our main uh, goal was to uh, recreate bushland which, uh, which looks like bushland. Um, and, you know, from the tall trees right down to the, uh, the understory of the pool. But where possible, we do plant uh, rare, rare, uh, rare plants. Now that the, the park's been there for 13 or 14 years and most of the, uh, uh, the trees and larger shrubs are established, we, we are concentrating more on uh, really interesting uh, things like lilies. Uh, we, we intend to uh, reintroduce orchids, donkey orchids and um, uh, onion orchids, uh, things like that. Um, we're, we're concentrating far more on uh, the lilies, chocolate lilies, uh, blue stars, all that stuff that, that, that's small and underfoot and uh, uh, just makes it much more interesting as you walk around. <coughs> when I started uh, work in the park about 12 or 13 years ago, there was uh, 120 species of birds had been recorded. Um, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, that had risen to 149. Now, we're not claiming credit for, uh, for all of that. Um, part of it is because um, there's more people recording. Some of them, no doubt, have uh, been uh, there or they, they come, they breed in the park where they never used to because of the habitat that's suitable. Um, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely um, helping the, the bird life along. And um, rare, uh, we had uh, um, magpie geese turn up about six months ago. First time but ever. First time mm -hmm. ever. I thought extinct in Victoria, reintroduced in northern Victoria, and now in the park. Well, and they had all the uh, had all the birdos rushing down, running around. <laughs> Unfortunately, they only stayed overnight, and they weren't there when they all arrived. <laughs> um, uh, we, we get things like fantail cuckoos and. Uh, uh, let me think. Um, uh, right at the moment, there's a, a, a grey shrike thrush that actually comes into a compound and uh, hops around looking for crumbs like the sparrows do. So that's really nice to see. Yeah. So um, it's the place is just alive with uh, the bird life. That's it, obvious. It's their biggest faunal fauna group. Mm. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, George. As I um, struggled to identify the uh, the insects that I saw in the park, um, 
I, I was focused at one stage on lerps and silids, which if you don't know, they're the little, they're the little white, usually white um, cover over a tiny insect that's nibbling away at the usually um, <coughs> red gum leaf. And, uh, and just a couple of weeks prior to that, we saw for the first time spotted pardalote. And uh, in doing my research about the lerps, I discovered that that was the food of the, the preferred food of the spotted pardalote. So, you know, here was a food chain already, you know, emerging before I arrived. days about Westgate Park, but I, no, I, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, well, one of the, one of the secrets, I think, is the inclusivity of the community of people who work down there. Um, with, with George and Naomi and Tony and so forth, they really accept anybody who comes down. And I went down there just to get my hands dirty to put things in the ground. And it turns out that I've been able to be used for almost everything that, that, that goes on. <laughs> Um, but I'm learning. I consider it a university of the third age for me. I'm learning about plants. I'm, my brain is going. I'm working physically. Uh, I think it's great. There's a, there's a whole group of baby boomers who are retiring who could be, you know, harnessed in this way. And the inclusivity of uh, working during the week means that we can uh, tap into Landcare's corporate market. So we have volunteers who pay $100 each per day, or their firm does, for them to come and shift mulch for us. <laughs> and it's fantastic. I mean, what a, what a wonderful thing to do. They, they come, they learn about the park, they go back to their offices, all financial services, people, you know, banks, um, accountancy firms, Telstra, wherever. They come to the park, they learn, we tell them about what we're doing. So there's an educative um, and dissemination project there as well. So we also have a work for the doll crew who come um, as part of their obli mutual obligations. They come two days a week. We have uh, groups of young people with mild intellectual disabilities. We have school groups who come. It's, it's, very, it's actually becoming much more than a friends group. It's a small business uh, for not-for-profit business. We realise we've actually outgrown the, the label of a friends group because we are doing so much more now than just um, working with a ranger once a month. In fact, we don't work with rangers once a month at all. So I'm hoping that ultimately, when we get over all the things that we're doing at the moment, we'll actually um, increase those links that were talked about, very important. We just need somebody to take that particular responsibility on. Um, and it just grows. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a never-ending, expanding universe down at Westgate Park. <laughs> it is. <laughs> We've all agreed it's a fantastic location. In talking with the Port of Melbourne uh, about their expansion, we're, we're really working with them for the riverside edge of land, which is not part of Westgate Park itself. It's part of the Port of Melbourne. Um, through the park and then down uh, Todd Road to here, to Perth White Reserve. So we're really looking at that as a connected landscape from the Coast Banks here woodland, which we plant along near the punt, um, sweeping through what we have a project for the southern wetlands, which we have um, uh, succeeded in lobbying the minister to have a, a spare piece of ground added to the park along our parade extension. 
um, and then linking that to Todd Road and the buffer work that's being going to be done by the port down to this point. Therefore, we're linked across the bay. Uh, I think that is a really important um, biodiversity link and it also, of course, will be a recreational link because you'll be able to, to walk or cycle through there as well. So, yeah, we don't really see Westgate Park as having any boundaries. No. <laughs>